Good day, everyone. Today, we want to look at a structure called the cerebellum. Now, the cerebellum and the basal ganglia work in conjunction to help modify movements. Information is sent from the motor cortex, both to the cerebellum and to the basal ganglia. And these two structures, even though they don't directly influence the motor neuron, indirectly by affecting firing in the motor cortex, they allow for smooth, coordinated movements. And as we saw in the basal ganglia, we'll also see as we study the cerebellum, that a problem with the cerebellum can pro produce profound movement deficits. So let's just review a little bit of the anatomy of the cerebellum. The cerebellum is found at the back of the brain in the posterior cranial fossa, and it's separated from the brain stem and the rest of the brain by a strong piece of dura mater known as the cerebellar tentorium. It only occupies about 10% by volume of the brain, but it's believed that almost half the neurons of the brain are found within the cerebellum. And because of this fact, and because of its folded shape and the way it looks, it's often referred to as the little brain. It's important also to appreciate that this uh, a compaction of neurons and the volume of neurons present indicate how important movement is in the context of brain function. Like the cortex, the cerebral cortex, the cerebellum can be spread out into a folded sheet that will be approximately 17 to 20 centimeters wide by 120 centimeters long. And it receives information from almost all the motor areas of the brain, as well as proprioceptive information from the spinal cord. And we'll see how important that is in helping to regulate movement. Now, from an anatomical point of view, we divide the cerebellum into three parts. We talk about the anterior lobe of the cerebellum, the posterior lobe of the cerebellum, and the flocculonodular lobe. However, from a functional point of view, in terms of what are the circuits involved in the cerebellum, and what do these circuits do, there's a slightly different division. Here we talk about the vestibular cerebellum, the spinal cerebellum, and the cerebral cerebellum. The vestibular cerebellum is associated with the flocculonodular lobe. The spinal cerebellum is associated with a midline structure called the vermis, and the medial parts of the cerebral hemispheres, known as the intermediate zone. And the final component, the cerebral cerebellum, is associated with the lateral components of the uh, cerebellar hemispheres. You can see that each of these regions have different functions. The vestibular cerebellum is important in balance and control of eye movement. The uh, spinal cerebellum influences the descending pathways that go via the corticospinal tract, and they're very important for the execution of movements. And then the cerebral cerebellum seems to be involved in planning, making sure movements are timed correctly and in sequence. Now, each one of these functional regions is associated with a deep nuclei. The vestibular cerebellum is associated with the vestibular nuclei of the brainstem. The spinal cerebellum is associated with two nuclei, the, vestig the vestigial nucleus and also the interposed nucleus, which itself is composed of the globose and the embelliform. And the cerebral cerebellum interfaces with the dentate nuclei. These nuclei help form the output tracts of the cerebellum. The input to the cerebellum is via three cerebellar peduncles that each serve to help attach the cerebellum to the back of the brain or the dorsal portion of the brain stem. The middle peduncle only has afferent fibers. The superior peduncle primarily has efferent fibers, where the inferior 
as both apparent and efferent light. Just going through and giving you an understanding of the structure of the cerebellum and how it's going to relate to its function. Okay. Like I said, all output is via the deep nuclei. And then this output crosses over to the thalamus on the contralateral side. Now that's very important because this creates something called double crossing. So let's look at it like this. The cerebellar cortex here on the left sends information to its deep cerebellar nuclei, which outputs to the thalamus on the right. The thalamus then goes to the right cortex, which sends information via the corticospinal tract, which crosses over back to the left. What this means is if there's a lesion in the left cerebellar cortex, it then results in ipsilateral sides because of signs, because of this double crossing. So let me go through this again. When you have a cerebellar lesion, they're found ipsilaterally. This is in contrast to a cortical lesion. If you have a stroke in the left cerebral cortex, the motor signs are demonstrated on the right-hand side. But if you have a stroke in the left cerebellar cortex, the signs are seen on the left side. And the reason is because of the double crossing. The cerebellar nuclei send their information to the thalamus on the opposite side, which sends information to the primary motor cortex, which in turn sends the corticospinal tract, which crosses and goes up to the opposite side. And this double crossing leads to ipsilateral cerebellum signs. One other thing to note that the cerebellum receives multiple, multiple inputs from the cortex and the somatosensory areas and the spinal cord. And the result of this is there's a lot more input than output. And so we see the cerebellum functioning as an integration center within the body. So what's the function of the cerebellum? This is especially interesting because electrical stimulation of the cerebellum produces no movement and no sensation. So you know because the brain has no pain receptors that during neurosurgery, in order to place an electrode say for deep brain stimulation, the patient can be awake. And to find out exactly where we want to place the electrode, we can stimulate certain parts of the brain and ask what they're experiencing to ensure that we get the exact placement. But interestingly, if you stimulate the cerebellum, there's no movement and there's no sensation. And yet a cerebellar disorder, a cerebellar lesion, uh, under development of the cerebellum leads to profound motor movements and disturbances in which the movement becomes very uncoordinated and very erratic. So we believe the primary function of the cerebellum is to modulate motor output. And it's considered that the cerebellum compares what will happen with what is intended to happen and makes an error correction before the error occurs. And this is what we call a feed forward mechanism. Now, the most common feedback mechanism that we know about in the body is a negative feedback mechanism. In a negative feedback mechanism, a change takes place. Say, for example, posture is disturbed. And that posture disturbance uh, leads to an unanticipated error. And then that information is fed back into the brain to adjust the posture. Some of typical examples of negative feedback are associated with homeostasis, like regulation of body temperature. And what we see inside of these systems is that there's an error correction that takes place after the error has been made. Now, these systems work very well, but they're somewhat slow. An error has to be made before an adjustment is correct, before the adjustment is put in place, before correction occurs. In the context of movement, that is way too slow for the body. You think about a skilled athlete or music player, or even you just walking down the road. 
You don't want to make an error and then adjust while you're walking. The body needs to correct movement errors before they occur. And this is what happens with the cerebellum. If you go to execute a task, the cerebellum knows your plan. While your body is executing the task, the cerebellum is tracking what's the direction of movement, what's the speed of movement, how forcefully are you moving, and it's monitoring that and comparing it to the plan. And if there's any suggestion that the sensory information coming back to the cerebellum does not line up with the plan, it makes an error correction before the error occurs. And this is called feed forward uh, anticipation. It reminds me a little bit of a movie uh, that came out in the 2000s, in 2004, I believe, uh, it's starring Tom Cruise called Minority Report, in which there was a system of detecting crime uh, before it occurred, and which, which people were arrested before they corrected the crime before they committed the crime, sorry. Uh, obviously, uh, that has a lot of ethical implications and it was quite an interesting movie. Uh, the cerebellum has no ethical implications. The cerebellum helps us greatly by correcting errors before they happen. So let's just run through what we'll say. The cortex comes up with a plan for movement and it sends that information via the spinal cord through your muscles and the movement actually begins. While that movement is taking place, information from your proprioceptors, your muscle spindles, your Golgi tendon organs are coming up to the cerebellum via the spinal cerebellar tract. And it's comparing the information of the movement with the plan. That's what's taking place in the cerebellum. If the cerebellum detects that the plan is not lining up with the actual movement. An error signal is generated. And that error signal feeds back to the cortex to now go to the spinal cord and correct the movement. And again, then you monitor the movement, compare it to the plan, and if necessary, correction takes place. And this ensures we have smooth movement via the feed forward mechanism, leads to the elimination of errors. We'll see in a little while that this process often takes some learning and the cerebellum is very involved in motor learning. So let's just look again at two minute neuroscience as they just summarize the anatomy and the functions of the cerebellum. Welcome to Two Minute Neuroscience where I simplistically explain neuroscience topics in two minutes or less. In this installment, I will discuss the cerebellum. Cerebellum is Latin for little brain, and the cerebellum does look like a miniature version of the brain as it protrudes from under the posterior and inferior region of the cerebral cortex. Although the cerebellum has many functions, it is primarily associated with movement. Specifically, it seems to be involved with facilitating movement by detecting errors that occur in the course of a movement and correcting them, so the movement appears fluid and achieves its intended goal. The cerebellum is also involved with motor learning to reduce the likelihood errors in movement will occur again in the future. The cerebellum consists of two cerebellar hemispheres and can be divided into three parts. The cerebral cerebellum receives input from the cerebral cortex and is involved with planning and initiating movements. The spinal cerebellum receives information about limb position and touch and pressure sensations from the spinal cord. The spinal cerebellum uses this information, for example, to compare where a limb is in space with where it should be if the movement were going as planned. If there is a discrepancy, the spinal cerebellum can modify motor signals to correct any errors in the movement. The vermis is the area of the spinal cerebellum that runs along the midline of the cerebellum. It is involved with posture, limb movement, and eye movements. The vestibulocerebellum, also called the floccular nodular lobe, is important to maintain the equilibrium, balance, and posture. The cerebellum communicates with the rest of the nervous system through three large pathways called the cerebellar peduncles, which include the superior, middle, and inferior cerebellar peduncles. When information is sent to the cerebellum, it takes an indirect path to reach extensively branched cells called Purkinje cells. These cells then project to a group of nuclei in the center of the cerebellum called the deep cerebellar nuclei. The deep cerebellar nuclei send the information to various areas in the brain stem and thalamus that then can influence motor areas of the cortex or descending motor tracts to modify movements.
Great. That was quite a useful summary of the cerebellum. So we can just compare uh, feedback systems and feedforward systems. We see that feedforward systems are anticipate in anticipatory, sorry. They correct the error before it happens, whereas feedback systems are reactive. Feedback systems respond to the current state of affairs. Both systems depend on sensory information, but feedforward systems have the ability to learn through experience. Feedback systems don't have that ability. And therefore, feedforward systems can modify the effect of feedback systems. And finally, feedforward systems are a lot faster than feedback systems. And in situations there where we need rapid action, we need a feedforward system. So this means that the cerebellum helps us with the maintenance of balance and posture, you would have just heard. It's also very important for the coordination of movements. So look at this cricketer about to play a shot and look at the number of different movements that have to take place in terms of his foot placement, his back swing, how he holds the bat, how he has to swing his arms. The cerebellum is important in coordinating all of those movements and managing the timing of those movements and ensuring the movements are smooth and skilled. And also remember that the cerebellum is also affecting the eyeball movements as the batsman tracks the ball from the bowler's hand onto the bat. We also know that the cerebellum is important for motor learning and therefore allows us to adapt movement. Uh, anybody who's ever learned to play a sport knows you can uh, start off in a very incoordinated manner, like when you're now learning to hit a tennis ball. But over time, you learn to adjust the strength of your swing and the angle of your swing to ensure that the ball lands. And finally, a lot of recent data is pointing to the fact that the cerebellum is involved in cognitive functions and also language processing. Our understanding of this is a lot more limited, but it does help explain why the cerebellum has so many neurons and all of its connections with other parts of the brain. Okay, so let's look a little bit at the internal circuitry of the cerebellum. Now, the cerebellum has a very regular arrangement of cells that's repeated over and over again. So it's a pretty simple architecture that's repeated millions of times. And there are five cells within the cerebellum. The output cells are these very large cells called Purkinje cells. They're found in the Purkinje cell layer. When you actually look at them, they have vast branching dendritic trees, and then they have a single output axon that goes to the deep nuclei. And these cells are inhibitory. They release GABA. There are a number of interneurons within the cerebellum that are also inhibitory. These are your Golgi cells, your basket cells, and your stellate cells. And the final cell is the granule cell, which receives a lot of the input signals into the cerebellum. And this is the only cell that is excitatory within the cerebellum. So here you see your granule cell receiving input from the mossy fiber. And here, where the mossy fiber meets the granule cell, and you also have a Golgi interneuron, this is often referred to and called the cerebellar glomeruli. It's a well-known structure within the cerebellum. So let's just repeat. There are five cell types within the cerebellum that help form a regular arrangement. Four of them are inhibitory, including the output cells, the Purkinje cells. The one excitatory cell is the granule cell. Now, these cells form a three-layer arrangement within the cerebellum cortex. Remember, the deep nuclei are found in the middle of the cerebellum. On the innermost uh, part of the cerebellum is the granule cell layer. The middle of the cerebellum is the Purkinje cell layer. And the most outer part is the molecular cell layer. So let's look at these cell layers in turn. 
Well, the granule cell layer, as we just showed you, this is the most inner part of the cell, cerebellum. Here you have your granule cells. Here you have your granule cells. This is an example right here. And remember, we told you that the granule cells receive input from the motifibers. The motifiers are bringing information from the spinal cord, from the motor cortex, from the brain stem. And we also told you that synapsing on the granule cells is not only the mossy fiber, but also the Golgi cell. And collectively, these form the cerebellar glomerulus. This confluence of the granule cells and the granule cell layer helps form the cerebellar glomeruli. Now, I just want you to note that the granule cell sends an axon up to the molecular cell layer. And then these axons split into these long dendrites that run at 90 degrees parallel to the axis of the cerebellum, at 90 degrees to the axis of the cerebellum. And these are called parallel fibers. They're found in a molecular cell. Layer. The middle layer is a Purkinje cell layer. And this is where you find the cell bodies of the Purkinje cells. Their dendrites are extensive, as you can see here, and they extend upwards into the molecular cell layer. These are very large cells, cell bodies 50 to 80 microns, and their axons go down through the cerebellum to interface and synapse on the deep nuclei to inhibit the deep nuclei by releasing GABA. And then finally, we have the molecular cell layer, the most outermost layer. Here you have the parallel fibers from the granule cells extending throughout the molecular cell layer and synapsing with the vast dendritic, dendritic trees of the Purkinje cells. So we see that the granule cell is able to influence the output cell of the cerebellum, the Purkinje cells, because of the extensive connections that are made between its dendrites, the parallel fibers, and the dendrites of the Purkinje cell. Here we also have synapses with the other interneurons, basket cells, and the cellate cells. Now, the input to the cerebellum we've already mentioned comes from two types of fibers. The first one we just mentioned is the Mossy cells. The Mossy cells send information from the brain stem nuclei, from the spinal cord, and from other parts of the brain. The Mossy fibers ascend and synapse on the granule cells. And multi fibers can synapse with numerous granule cells. Numerous, numerous granule cells. The role of the mossy fibers, it's believed, is to bring back that information that I was talking to you about. It's to bring all that sensory information, all that proprioceptive information from the body while movement is taking place. And it's to compare that with the intended movement. Another thing to note is the mossy fiber sends a signal to the deep nuclei before it goes up to the granule cell. And this is also typical of our climbing fiber. Our climbing fiber comes only from the inferior olive. So it's different from the mossy fiber. And from the inferior olive, it goes and it synapses directly on the dendrites of the Purkinje cells, wrapping itself around the Purkinje cells and exciting them. The mossy fiber is believed to generate the error signal of the cerebellum. So I want you to see what happens here. All the sensory processing information from the periphery is coming from the brainstem nuclei, the spinal cord via the mossy fibers. It's being processed in the cerebellum and that's generating an error signal. That error signal then somehow gets fed back through the inferior olive to the climbing fiber, which then inhibits, then, sorry, excites the Purkinje cell and adjusts the firing of the Purkinje cell, which as you know, is the output of the Purkinje cell. So if no adjustment has to be made, the mossy fiber is in control and the signaling is normal. But when there's an error signal that's generated, 
it comes via the climbing fiber. And that climbing fiber then adjusts the frequency of the perpendicular cell firing and leads to an endoscopy. This is just showing you that output from the Purkinje neurons uh, leads via the deep nuclei, crosses over to the thalamus, and then goes to the cerebral cortex, the brainstem, and the spinal cord. The Purkinje cells actually inhibit the deep nuclei, and the deep nuclei themselves are excitatory. So just like we saw in the basal ganglia, the output is generally inhibitory, damping down movements and less stimulation in the system. So this is the pathway. The information comes from the mossy fiber and it goes to the deep nuclei first. Then it brings sensory information that gets processed in the cerebellum and gets outputted via the Purkinje cell. And somehow there's a comparison between what's been intended and what's taking place. And if an error signal gets detected, that gets fed back through the climbing fibers which modifies the activity of the Purkinje cell and leads to learning and modification of firing. We're not exactly sure how it, this happens. And of course, it's a lot more complex, but at your level, this is what you're expected to understand. So this just summarizes what we said on the mossy fibers, about the mossy fibers. Uh, and it highlights the fact that mossy fibers produce something called a simple spike, a simple signal that goes on to the granule cells. And then the granule cells in sequence the firing of numerous Purkinje cells. You can see that each Purkinje cell can get input from as many as a million granule cells because of their terminating branches. This complex spike is what's generated by the climbing fiber. And this is a long lasting potential that can greatly modify the firing of the Purkinje cell. This does not happen very often. It doesn't happen very often, this prolonged depolarization due to the opening of calcium channel. And it's therefore believed to be an important part of the error signal and motor learning. Some of these things. Uh, you just have to accept as we try to understand exactly what's going on in the brain. So this is what I'm saying here. It's believed that during movement, climbing fibers provide the error signals that depress the parallel fiber. And this allows the correct movements to emerge. So now let's look at what happens when things go wrong in the cerebellum. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to look at each functional part. So the first part is the vestibular cerebellum, also known as a floccular nodular lobe. And it gets its input signals from the vestibular organs and the superior colliculus. The superior colliculus, you know, is a key part of the brain involved in eyeball movements. It also gets input from the striate cortex, which is at the back of the brain as an important for processing visual information. The output is via the vestibular nuclei, the only nuclei of the cerebellum that aren't found in the cerebellum, but are actually found in the brain stem. And we believe that the vestibular cerebellum helps to coordinate movements of the head and neck and movements of the eyes, and is also helping to coordinate the axial muscles and posture. Therefore, lesions within the cerebral cerebellum can lead to difficulty with balance and therefore difficulty with walking like ataxia. And also a condition where the eyes are not able to keep still because control of the eyeball movements is lost. And you get this oscillating pattern called nystigmus, as is shown in this diagram. Can you feel your eyes move? No. You don't feel them move? No. And when you look at things, Look this way. When you look at things, do they look like they're moving or still? Still. Still. Uh huh. Hold still so I can film it and then we'll put it on YouTube like the other people and you can see them. Do you remember what I said it's called? No. Congenital nystagmus. Oh. Oh, don't. We just got that on film. <laughs> 
people are going to see you pick your nose. So that's an example of nystagmus. Uh, notice the oscillatory movement of the eyes. Uh, the person experiencing it doesn't notice it, and they still are able to fixate as the brain learns. Then we have the spinocerebellum. And the spinocerebellum has two parts to it. Remember, we spoke about the vermis and the intermediate zone. On the spinocerebellum, there's a map of the body, as you can see here. And you can see the vermis involves the axial muscles. And so it also gets information from the vestibular organs and the visual nuclei. And, but it also gets proprioceptive information from the axial muscles. And it's very important, therefore, in helping to regulate balance and coordination of movement. When you have problems with the vermis, we tend to get uh, ataxia with the typical cerebellar walk. This is an example of somebody uh, demonstrating the challenges of walking uh, with a lesion in the cerebellum. Uh, I want you to try to walk with one foot touching the other, eh? just like the drunk test. And I'm going to stand right by you here. Okay, I'll give you a little bit of balance and this is going to be very difficult for you. Okay. That's, that's enough. The intermediate zone, as you saw, gets information now, uh, not so much from the axial muscles, but the muscles of the limb. And therefore, it's going to be involved in coordinating limb movements. We also notice that it gets information from the muscles that control speech. So problems with the intermediate zone lead to typical symptoms of a cerebellar disorder, like dysarthria, slurred speech, dysmetria, where there's overshooting or undershooting of a target, an intention tremor, where as a person approaching an object, uh, they, they start to get a tremor. And you also get decreased muscle tone and tender reflexes. Let's see a few examples. The principal signs of cerebellar disease are dysmetria, dysdiatocokinesia, and ataxia. Dysmetria is the inability to coordinate a complex motor activity involving several muscle groups. In this example, the patient is asked to repeatedly touch the examiner's finger and then her own nose. Note that the initial trajectory is misdirected and that the ensuing mid-course correction overcorrects and the finger misses the target. Observe dysmetria in slow motion. Sometimes it is inappropriately called an intention tremor. However, with intention tremor, the extremity oscillates with an amplitude and frequency that remains approximately constant throughout the course of the movement. During dysmetria, there are mid-course corrections of trajectory that can be mistaken for oscillations. So this is an example of the well-known finger-to-nose test. Here we'll see another example of that test. ...of tremor disorder, in addition to rest tremor and postural tremor, is intention action tremor seen with cerebellar disease. In this patient, who has had a traumatic hemorrhage involving one side of his cerebellar white matter pathways, he has a normal function on the right side, but the left side shows significant dysenergia and intention tremor. This type of tremor contrasts, however, with the postural tremor in that both the trajectory and the endpoint are abnormal, and most of this patient's dysfunction is in fact right at the endpoint when he tries to touch his nose or to bring his finger totally out. The trajectory is not normal, but the trajectory is not the area of maximal dysfunction. This type of tremor can also be seen in multiple sclerosis and other primary cerebellar disorders. So there you saw an example of uh, a cerebellar disorder, and you saw the ipsilateral associated with it. Finally, let's look at an example of hypotonia and pendular reflexes due to cerebellar disorders. Beep. Yep. <laughs> Uh, 
So that example there, where we uh, leg oscillating, is because the tone is reduced, and so it moves like a pendulum once the reflex occurs. So all of these are examples of uh, problems in the cerebellum associated with control of the limbs. Well, the cerebral cerebellum is important for planning motor movements and also in coordinating movements. It receives fibers from the motor cortex and the premotor cortex that helps involve planning, as well as feedback information from the spinal cord. And its output, again, is to the red nucleus and back to the motor cortex. Many of the signs that you see with problems with the spinal cerebellum, especially the intermediate zone, you can also get with the cerebral cerebellum, including this didokinesia, in which you ask somebody to perform rapid alternating movements of the hand. And they often have difficulty doing this. And this especially occurs if there's movement across multiple joints where we talk about decomposition of movements. I wasn't able to find a good uh, example of this diagonal but here's one that does show you it a little bit. So you can see then that depending on what part of the cerebellum has a problem, it will manifest with different symptoms. One of the interesting things about a cerebellum to note is that many of the symptoms of a cerebellar disorder mimic alcohol intoxication. And that's because alcohol depresses the activity of the cerebellum. And interestingly, long-term alcohol use can actually destroy the cerebellum and produce cerebellar dysfunction on a more permanent basis. The final thing I just want to mention to you is that the cerebellum is very important for motor learning. Many of the complex motor movements that we make, we aren't able to do straight away. We're not born with them. Think about riding a bicycle. Think about playing an instrument. Think about the fact that initially you have to think about these things and they're very difficult, but eventually you learn and you become more skilled at them. In this example here, Someone is taught to throw a dart and hit the bullseye. Initially, they make mistakes, but they get reasonably good at it. Then they're, put, they're asked to wear a special set of glasses that shift the image to the right. The end result is once they put on the glasses, they start missing. But over time, the brain learns to adjust the trajectory of their throw, and they get better and better. And then when you take the glasses off, the brain has to learn all over again. Now, the interesting thing about this is we wouldn't know the cerebellum was involved unless we do this experiment with people with cerebellar disorders. And when you give this experiment to someone with cerebellar disorders, note that their learning in the beginning is also not as good as a normal person, normal functioning cerebellum. But after they put on the glasses, they seem to have no ability to learn. And this tells us that the cerebellum is very, very important in motor learning. And that feed-forward mechanism gets better and better the more you repeat a task and the more the cerebellum is able to learn. So that brings us to the end of our look at the cerebellum. I just want to remind you that even though we know quite a lot about the cerebellum, there is much that we still don't understand and much that we still can't mimic uh, in our quest to build robots that move like human beings. And therefore, great work is going into understanding how the cerebellum works uh, and learning to develop uh, circuits and using technology to reproduce some of these movements. Maybe you'll find yourself involved in some of that uh, later on in your career. Until next time, take care and be safe.